the, you talked about the dopamine here, but it's, it's the blue pill, right? You get that blue pill every two weeks to remind you that, oh man, like I, I don't have to go out there, scrape and scratch or figure out how to package my skills to solve other people's problems in a way where they're willing to see the value so that it can replace the money that I earn to pay these people. What's happening? Uh, it's your boy Desmond here with Campfire Nation, and we are here to have a good time today. I have my co-host Heather Stafford, and we also have a very special guest today, our man Jerome Myers. It's going to be a good one because this guy is a legend. So let me kind of give you guys an understanding of who this guy is. He's a developer of people and places. He's a founder and chief inspiration officer of Two Ventures, Dreamcatchers, is a boutique coaching firm that supports first and second generation wealth creators to self-actualize and attain transcendence in the Myers Development Group, where he helped ordinary people invest into multifamily real estate, cha-ching, in a way that creates generational wealth. Cha-ching, let's go. You know, through these entities, he gets to live out his childhood dreams of helping people manifest the things they imagine. And he is the evidence that dreams should be real. Since leaving corporate America after building a $20 million division, Jay has become one of the most sought after leaders into multifamily development space. His company, the Myers Development Group, built a multi-million dollar portfolio following the principles of Myers Method. Okay, we definitely have to unpack that. And then mm -hmm. um, this success has led him to uh, being featured on top podcasts such as Best Real Estate Investing Advice Ever, with your boy Joe Fairless, apartment investing with Michael Blank, multi-family investor nation with Dan Hanford, target market insights with John Kasman, and of course, Campfire Capitalism, where we love to make money and live with purpose at the same time. Although he's often told he makes investing look easy, the people doesn't don't doesn't uh, the, uh, the people closest to him know the road wasn't without challenges. So, if he, so he created Myers Method, a real estate education company to dispel many of the myths related to the industry and educate investors on his four-step process to own, to owning and operating apartments. All right, Mr. Mr. Myers, nice to have you. What's up, man? Desmond, grateful to be with you, brother. Thanks for having me. Oh yeah, for sure, man. So we like to just dive straight in into the madness. So like, how did Morpheus become Morpheus, man? It took ah! the red pill, right? I mean, red you got to take the red pill. But I mean, you, you talked about it a little bit in the bio, right? We, we've got this model and we'll do, probably dive into it later. But I, if, I figured out how to make money. I got to the top of the building and then I realized I didn't want to be there, right? And so I jumped out. And then when I was in the space, what I realized was I was playing in my own little world and I wasn't really reaching out and showing anybody else what could be done. I wasn't living out that thought of being able to inspire other people. And so level six of our model is success or significance. We believe the only real significance or the only real success is significance. But significance, another word for that is transcendence, right? I think most of the people who want to be more the people who want to make a big difference they they want to be immortal that's what i wanted to be when i was a kid but that immortality didn't mean well today it doesn't mean like i live on forever it means parts of me live on through other people and so that's why that significance is so important and why we tie it to success sure you can make money you can be able to do whatever you want to do but if you're not positively impacting the lives of other people do you really deserve your breath That's sad. Man, that's deep. That's deep. So um, I guess what I'm like really itching to like unpack here is this, this transition, right? To be a multi-million dollar man at a corporation and then switching over into, you know, into these two different businesses. Like talk to us about that shift to like what shifted with you and like, what was that journey like when you did shift? Like talk to us a little bit about, about the story a little bit. 
Yeah, so on January 13th of 2015, I got handed a stack of documents. I was employee number two in the division, and the client wanted us to do something that most people said was impossible. And so we went off to do that. And by the end of September of that year, I had 175 people on my team. By the end of the year, we did 20 million in revenue, 30% profit margins. I get a phone call on December 24th at 4.55, and it goes something like this. Jerome, you and I have been going back and forth for about three weeks. Here's the thing. It made a decision. We're going to lay half of them off. And I was like, no, no, that's not the right decision. Like, we just need to figure out how to redeploy these people. We'll need them later. Jerome, I didn't call to have a negotiation with you. I told you I made a decision. We're going to lay half of them off. Now, you can continue to try to fight this, but we're either going to do this with or without you. Okay. I still don't think this is the right decision. Jerome, listen, I'm going to go spend the rest of the year with my family. I'll talk to you in the new year. Wait, wait, boop, boop, boop. If you got an iPhone, you know what that was. And so I'm looking, I'm like, oh man, maybe the call dropped. Then I realized he hung up on me, right? He was done with the conversation. And so on Christmas Eve, I had a dilemma that I never faced. I had to figure out which half of the people on my team were going to have a job in the new year. And that didn't sit well with me. And I went along with it thinking, oh, well, you know, they're the bad guy. They told me that we had to do this. And when... I got to about three days before Thanksgiving of the next year. I was having a very similar conversation. And it was at that point I realized that I truly had agency, right? It wasn't about what they said. I, I made the choice to participate. I made the choice to pick who was going to stay. I made the choice to pick who was going to go. I made the choice to stay in a situation where I thought I was in control because I ran the day to day. And, you know, I talked to them every other week and I saw them once a quarter. But when it came down to actually making the decision on how the business really ran, the buck didn't stop with me. It went somewhere else. And so I decided I would bet on myself, man. So I dropped out, right? I thought I'd just go buy an apartment building and everything would be hunky-dory, but that's not actually how it played out. And I thought, oh, man, well, I'll just pivot. I can do consulting. We built this amazing leadership development program because we made all these new leaders because of how rapidly we grew. And I realized that the people who I thought like were my friends and would help me build a new business, they didn't care about me. They cared about the title I held and the fact that I could flow them. But when the shoe was on the other foot, I had to go to scratch. I had to go to ground zero. So when I left, I didn't really have a soft land. And in fact, it was hard. Unfortunately, I had some cash and I had some resources, but it, it was totally the wrong way to do it. But in hindsight, made me who I am today. So I don't think this could have happened without that happening. Wow. That, that takes, that takes guts. Just be like, yeah, I'm not going to do this. Doesn't matter what yeah. it's, what it's going to do to me or what it's going to, what it's, what's going to, what it's going to cause, but I'm not going to do this. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I think most of us are addicted to the paycheck. Right. Know that on the second Friday and the fourth Friday, we're going to get paid or on the 26th or the first and the 15th or whatever that cadence is where you get that little hit in your bank account. But if you go out and you don't you don't have a sales background, because I didn't, I was an operations guy. I got an engineering degree. I got a project management I got a business degree at a graduate level. But I wasn't a sales guy for a long time. I, I did it for a very short period. How do you get revenue in the door? And I think that's the biggest fear that keeps people in the matrix. I don't know how to sell anything. I'm not going to pay anybody for sales training. And because I don't want to be a sleazy salesperson, but you don't have a business if you don't sell anything. And so I think we got to shift the paradigm and really begin to think about like, what are we actually doing? Because if a company's paying you, it's not because they're getting reimbursed dollar for dollar. They're selling your ability and you're skipping down the street, not actually maximizing the return on the investments that you've made in your life. True. You know, it's funny. It comes like, down to it. I was going to say like, uh, 
when you're an employee, you get paid for your time. When you are uh, not an employee, you're obviously getting paid for the problem that you're solving, right? And I feel like we probably brought this up, Heather, like I feel like maybe three or four times. A hundred times. How you lit- if you do not sell, like your business does not make sales. Like you, like you said, you just don't have a business. And like sales is more about serving people and actually helping people get a solution to their problem than it is about you getting paid. Like you getting paid is just a transit, a transaction of energy for them to get what they want. Um, so, well, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's an inevitable outcome. And the truth is, is that no, you don't have a business unless you sell. And the, the other side of this is yes, he's Jerome's very right. Um, if everything was reimbursed dollar for dollar, there would be a lot, a lot bigger, like sizable gaps in like what people are getting paid. Like there'd be a a bigger sliding scale. And the truth is, is that everybody would be an entrepreneur and not everybody's supposed to be. They're not meant to be. They, most people, 95% of people in this world should never own their own business. Absolutely not. It is. And 95% of those people in this world, no matter what kind of training they go through, will not be, they are not wired to do it. They're not. Now for that 5% that is wired to do it, should they, yes, they should be doing it. And let's try not to, you know, reinvent the wheel every time somebody started. It's not rocket science. Building a business is good math. It's strategy and and really good math. That's it. Oh, okay. So feelings, it's not passion feeds it. Sure. It creates it. Yes. Does it push it along, along the railroad tracks? Absolutely. But your feelings and your passion and your stance and like how you feel about A or B or C has nothing to do with good business. It has everything to do with great product, excellent service, amazing experience. But it doesn't mean it's just good business. Good business is math and strategic placement. Ooh, I think this is a good pivot now since we like being an entrepreneur, it's definitely good math. And not everyone can be an entrepreneur, but everyone could be an investor to some degree, which is where yes. Mr. Fire's zone of genius is in as well. So like talk to us about like your your like you mentioned that you can buy an apartment building and you know, you started with that, like, talk to us about like your investment journey. Like what was your first property? Like, what were some less, like, what are some, um, some lessons you learned and like, how did that grow into like your, your educational platform and, in 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 that part of the business? Yeah. Before I go there, let me, let me drop a pin in something. And so I think the majority of the listeners here probably have heard of Robert Kiyosaki's Cashflow Quadrant. And so there's a lot of educators who are encouraging employees to rush to the I quadrant and be investors. So you got employees, self-employed, business owner, investor. Employees running to the investor quadrant is a recipe for 40 years working, hoping to retire, and then live for 10 years after you're done. What I encourage people to do is figure out how to become a business owner. Even if you're not the operator of that business, you want to become a business owner create the equity, harness that equity. And then if you don't want to put it back in the business, then invest that. You got more leverage to pull when you're a business owner. It gives you the opportunity to ratchet the income or the value of that thing so that you can actually pull off. Putting your $10,000 or your maxing out your 401k or 18k a year is not going to get you retired in five, 10, or even 15 years. And most people don't do the math on that. And so this rolls into the real estate piece. There's a lot of people who say, oh man, yeah, just put your money in my deal as a limited partner or an LP. Let me give you an eight pref. And then, you know, you might get a 15% IRR on the deal. That's not going to actually get you to where you're trying to go. Especially if you got $10,000 or let's call it 50. If you got 50 and you get a 10 prep to make the math, because I'm not good at math, right? You you get $5,000 a year in cash flow. So if you want, let's call it $100,000 a year, and you're not going to get 10%, but let's say you get 10%, 
It means you need a million dollars invested in cash flow to get your 100K. People have to do the math back to what Heather was saying in order to make a business decision. It's always a math problem every single time. So how did we get to this space with Myers Methods? So we did our first deal. I won't bore the listeners with that story. Then we did our second and our third. And my buddy was like, dude, we're using the Myers methods. I was like, all right, here we go. What are you talking about? Cause he's a jokester and he's, he markets everybody else's stuff, but he never really markets his stuff. Right. He's like, this is the Myers methods. What do you, okay. What is it, man? He said, you find fun, fix and flip deals. He said, find fun, fix, flip. Those four F's. Okay. Find fun, fix, flip. Okay. So what's fine? He said, well, think about it. We sent letters. We talked to owners. We found something. We got the financials. We evaluated it. And we decided that it was something we should buy. Okay. So what's fun? That's the part where you, you do your business plan. You do all your due diligence. You find other partners to pay for the down payment. You get your bank partner. You get your property manager. You get your contractors. You get... You get your business plan, you get everybody on board with that. And then once you close, you start fixing it. All right, so what's fixing it? Well, usually everybody's gonna say you're gonna increase the rents and you're gonna decrease the expenses. So whatever that meant in your business plan, that's what you do. Okay, so what's flipping it? Uh, you can do one or two things. You can refinance it, get your original money out. Everybody's talking about Burr and single family now, but commercial people have been doing it for decades. Or you can sell it. Oh, and then if you sell it, you can flip that into another deal. And it only takes two, three of those deals to get to a place where you can be financially free. Whoa. Find fun, fix, flip. I'm all the way in on it. And so we started doing a conference and we created a community and we started teaching a course. Because what I saw was a lot of people, specifically folks who were not white males between the age of 35 and 55, were not represented on any of the platforms, right? You go look at the conference lineup. You go look at the podcast guests. It, nobody looked like me for sure. Heather wasn't really represented either. And I mean, I appreciate your short haircut and the glasses. You, you weren't showing up either, bro. I, you're not there. And so we were like, well, we're going to do a couple of things. One, we're going to change the face of wealth. What does that mean? Everybody's not going to believe that you have to be clean shaven in a suit with a little bit of gray in your hair, maybe a little bit more, depending on how sophisticated you want to look and look European. You don't have to do that. You can be a former college football player with hair down to the middle of your back with ex tattoos on your forearms and still be somebody who is actually an accredited investor. That's totally okay. And we knew we were on the right track when we were at a friend's event and one of the people in our community walked up to us and said, where's all the black people? And it was the four of us. There was one other person in, in the conversation. And I looked at her and said, why do we have to whisper? And I knew that we had to do something. We had to do more, right? And so she created a Facebook group called More. It's more uh, minorities, something in real estate, right? And so, but the point is, like, we wanted people to understand that you didn't have to grow up wealthy in order to be an owner or an operator. There were some minimal investments that you could make in order to get the knowledge you needed in order to find a deal so that you could take that deal and partner with other people and then use those experience partners in order to get the capital that you need to do the deal. What are you talking about, Jerome? Every investor is trying to overcome four things, knowledge, deal flow, experience, and capital. People try to overcome them in a bunch of different orders, but it doesn't work that way. It doesn't matter. Anybody who closes a deal needs the knowledge first so that they can evaluate leads to determine whether or not they're deals. Leads and deals have the same letters. They're not the same thing. 
elite is something that you may make, you can't make any money on. You're going to write a check to get out of it. A deal is something you might make money on if you execute your business plan. Then the next level, you, I got this, I got this deal. The value add is you having the deal. You got it under contract. You negotiate it. Hey, you've got experience doing this. Are you interested in partnering on this deal? Great. Because the bank who's writing a check for 60 to 80% of the money in the deal is only going to invest in a proven operator with a great deal. They are not going to give you money because you dream that you should be an apartment operator. They need an experienced operator and a great deal. That's when they put their money in. They don't invest in dreams. And so everybody worries about, oh, well, how much money do I have? Like they're going to the store to buy a Gucci bag. It doesn't matter. The money doesn't matter. What matters is that you have the knowledge so you can evaluate the leads to find the deals, find the deals, take to the experience operator. And then once you have that, the capital will flow. So that's our approach. That's how we got there. And at the end of the day, the reason that I got interested in this is because me and my buddy Duran were sitting on the stoop at our apartment complex, sophomore year in college. I stayed upstairs. I had two roommates. We were all playing 395. Duran was downstairs. 395 happened in his unit as well. We multiplied across the complex. The guy was making $700,000 a year. We never saw him or talked to him. We didn't understand expenses. We didn't understand any of that. Third party manager in place, maintenance person, rocking it out. How do you do? How, how is he doing that? Again, we, we never saw him. We didn't talk to him. So I'm the son of a soldier and a stay at home mom. Nobody with a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio was coming to the cookout. So where was the access? There wasn't any for me. And so for little Jerome and little Duran, we wanted to create a situation where they could come in and get access so that they can get into the game. Because I think it's here for everybody. If you're willing to do the hard work of evaluating the lease so you can find the deal. Dude, appreciate the game. And um, a lot of that landed big time, especially I learned the, that what you just said with you have the capital, but are you an operator? And I learned that real quick with the banks. Right. And um, which is, you know, how I was able to get into my first property was someone with 25 years of experience knew how to run the game and I just simply provided the capital. They know how to sell and all this other stuff and, and find tenants and run the property. We run into situations. They know what to do in terms of like how to handle those tenants and worst come to worst with them. We're rolling that property into two more properties, right? A year later, tenants moved out because of, you know, not paying bills. Our extra strategy was to sell it. We're selling it for like a 15% profit from what we paid for list for it. And we're going to roll those pro roll that into the next property. And when we do the math, what got me freaking excited was like, wow, like we're going to turn one into two. Right. And then like, and then we're like, dang, maybe in, in two or three years that maybe two turns into, you know, two turns into eight. four or five, right? It turns like, into eight. It turns, turns into, into eight. That's turns into, mm -hmm. I like eight your math, Jerome. So, so, so man, the math is crazy. So, um, man, dude, this is sick. So Heather, I'll let you, I'll let you, I'll let you go down. Cause I'm excited. We're no, about to, like, you're good. Ask all types of questions. No, I mean, honestly, like I agree, like one of my biggest sticking points and you know me, like if you're going to build a business, build a good one. And if you're going to do it, do it the right way. Like some of the hardest things that I stick on, like I have built, I have built industries, I built businesses in almost every industry um, with almost every type of model that you can come up with. I mean, we've, I've gone from like software and research and data in healthcare to, you know, products from sales to, to service and everywhere in between. And it has so much to do with, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? What problem are you solving? And are you solving it the right way the first time? Or are you trying to, are you trying to shortcut getting there? Because if you're trying to shortcut getting there, you'll fail. Period. Now, with the model that you put, they, that you put together, you give people the opportunity 
to say, yeah, I want to be a business owner. And I'm well informed that I am not the operator. Because that 5%, those are your, those are your owner operators. Those are people like us who own, create, maintain, update, innovate, and stick with it every single second of the day, because that is what we are addicted to. I couldn't do anything else. I've had one regular job in my whole life and it lasted about 13 months. And I worked for two companies in 13 months. Now it was, I, I got lucky. I had a relatively big job. I worked for some relatively big companies. I worked for Bear Stearns and Wells Fargo and then um, JP Morgan and Chase Manhattan. But I was there during their acquisitions because I can see patterns. So I had a very specific job, job skill. Other than that, like I've never punched a clock. I'm 40 years old and I have never punched a clock other than that. I did nine years of active duty in the military. But I, I don't know what most people go through in the paycheck thing. Like I'm making money is easy. How you do it, why you do it, not burning yourself out, all the things that come with making money, that's hard. Those are the pieces that people don't realize. They're like, oh, it must be nice to be your own boss. Mm, are you sure? Did you see me three nights ago at 4.30 in the morning still not having gone to sleep because something had to be done? No. It's not glitter and glammy. It's not beautiful and fun. It's not Instagram reels. It's hard work. It's hard work. Now, it is the only kind of hard work that I would care to do ever. I wouldn't have it any other way. It's, but it's people almost... need the opportunity to make their money work for them because the median income line will not change unless we start teaching people to do things differently. Because most of the people in the world don't know how to make more money without literally running themselves into the ground. So it almost it almost brings us back into like the matrix topic of like the dopamine hit. Right. Like when you work for someone, you get in that dopamine hit once or twice a month, like, boom, I got my 60 percent of my check today. Right. Like you look forward to it. And it's almost like we have to recondition people with education, like the Myers method of like, hey, here is a different way to do things. And you create new dopamine hits. There's nothing better than you get a check or you get that, that notification of you just got paid for your, your, your rental property. I think there's nothing that's wow. Like, wow, I just got this money and I didn't have to show up and punch a clock for it. And so then it creates, it feeds it because now you want more of it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> so, well, not so, to mention the fact that like you get dopamine hits from, from getting paid. There's also, there is a significant amount of like, there's a significant amount of, um, I don't want to say gratitude, but absoluteness in the safety that you're not responsible for it. There's a, a, an emotional give on not being the person that is responsible for all of it. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yes, <laughs> because God knows that the amount of weight, like I don't know very many people that can take it. I don't. It's not, it's not for everybody. Oh, this is good. And so uh, I got a question for you, Jerome, because I think this kind of goes into something else that we can jump into, which is I know that you're really big on leadership, right? Like you obviously know how to fast, like grow, you know, grow an organization pretty quickly, teaching, you know, people how to manage properly. Like what is your your take on like the pivot or the change or, or your take on like how easy it is for leaders of organizations, right? If they're an executive or middle management to move into an operator of their own business, right? Do you like what talk to us about that transition or are there similar principles and leadership of someone working in middle management or leadership in the company to then like spin off their own company? Like what are some lessons you learned in that? Yeah. So I think they're different skill sets, right? As a middle manager, you don't set direction. There isn't a ton of strategy. There's here's what we're doing and you need to manage your group in order to get there. I think there's a big difference between a leader and a manager. What you said that was super interesting and I, I want to dive down the rabbit hole, but I, I don't want to leave this point, but you, you talked about not being able to handle the pressure, right? I, I want to go all the way down that hole because it's why 
the real estate is just a course now instead of there being any coaching tied to it. And we can come back to that. But to go down this leadership conversation, are the skills transferable? Yes. But what happens is you get soft, right? You, you've you got all of the cush of, oh, well, just go to the file cabinet and get the paper out. Usually when you're on your own, you got to go to Target to get the paper, right? I ran out of ink today and I was like, what am I going to do? Like, do I send it to Office Depot? Do I go get an ink card? Like, what do I do with that? Do I do I call somebody to do it for me or do I take care of it myself? Right. Like these are conversations when people come out of corporate that they they get lost in. And then, oh, by the way, there's the lifestyle that is attached to the salary. And you talked about the dopamine hand, but it's it's the blue pill. Right. You get that blue pill every two weeks to remind you that oh man, like I don't have to go out there, scrape and scratch or figure out how to package my skills to solve other people's problems in a way where they're willing to see the value so that it can replace the money that I earn to pay these bills. Right. It, it's just easier for me to have people show up. Right. Cause there's a marketing department over there to do that. There's a marketing and there's there's a salesperson to do that. All I got to do is fulfill the offer. But go f- sell the offer, then fulfill it, then bill it, and then have a conversation with the operator. Because I, I don't know that most people are, to Heather's point, built for that. Honestly, it's not even, I think that the human, like, the 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 human physiological system was built for it. Most people were conditioned for it. And it, it comes from one of the two extremes. You either went through extreme circumstances and learned how to adapt exceptionally fast. So you pick up skill sets like this and go. Or you have the other side of that extreme, which happens to be where I came from. Like I came from a super open-minded, very artistically driven, like explorative type family who is wildly supportive and like literally would be like, hey, you want to do this? Let's go. You want, oh, we're going to try this? Let's go. Like I just, I had, I was lucky enough to be in just the right environment for who I was naturally and all of my natural like talent. And my parents are pretty freaking rad. Like, I don't, I don't have a, we laugh about this often because as an entrepreneur, I started like, as I started growing influence, it was like, do you have a story? I'm like, no, nope. I have one of those like high five, like always had the right kind of support, got lucky pretty much every time I turned around and my parents were really good about let's figure out how to get you there. And that environment, that fostering, like there isn't anything that you shouldn't try gave me the ability to grab for skill sets really fast. Okay, I want this and, and next. And I want and just continue to try things without second guessing or doubting or beating myself up because I didn't end up loving something. So it was an interesting experience because those are the only two types of people I see that aren't severely affected by pressure. So I have to get to send yes and this goes on a list and this goes on and, and go here and go here and then just solve your way through it. I don't know. That's that's just my take. Yeah. I, I love how we're like, you know, business partners and podcast hosts and friends because like we come from like we have two different sources, Jerome. Right. So Heather was like, you know, the supportive family, like had a, you know, a, the, that that like great environment. And I had great parents as well, don't get me wrong, but like I had like, you know, the school of hard knocks and you know, really had to learn a lot of things on my own in order to like progress. And to be honest, like it wasn't until I went to Turkey and saw like other people of how they lived during like an international science fair of really that, like, let me that pop my bubble of like, wow, there's a whole nother world out here other than little Dayton, Ohio. Right. Where mm-hmm. like pe- people aren't owners or like people just fall in line and like do the same pattern over and over again. 
right? Even things that they know that are to their detriment, like how they eat, right? Like who they hang out with, right? Like they do things. It's crazy, like being outside of the bubble, looking back in and retrospective, like to see people do things self-destructively in order to impress people that they don't even like, right? Oh, <laughs> I, think that I love that one. Thing. I think that was the biggest thing. Like <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt myself to impress people that I don't even like anyway, because I want their approval of me. So we do that because it's wired in us, right? Because the tribe acceptance by the tribe is the difference between life and death Mm -hmm. in the old society. There's no saber tooth tiger anymore. (laughs) Unfortunately, the old society isn't, it's, it's not evolving as fast as we are. I hope that it's picking up speed. Don't get me wrong. But the truth is, is that people are still indoctrinated into the fact that that is life or death. Yeah, but it's not. The, what are we worried about? Oh, I'm not sure what they're worried about, darling. I couldn't tell you what they're worried about, but they're still worried. <laughs> yeah. That's the beautiful part. People like you, people like Desmond, like, you guys are you're speaking on a topic constantly that people are terrified to say anything about because they're still worried. Okay, well, what does this mean for me? And 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 is everybody else gonna still love me? Well, probably, obviously, and that's up to you. Oh man, we're about to dive into something because I'm super interested to like spar this with Jerome. So like. Um, my like driver was always like, get out and do like, and build something. And I've been having this, like, I had this crazy moment, man, like a month ago where I was like, like, how can I, which is why we're doing the podcast, but like, you know, how can I just be the source for other people who look like me, who came from very similar backgrounds that I've done in a way that lands, right? Where people can create their own path. And even with my family, man, right? Like, I feel like, you know, as, you know, as entrepreneurship, you gotta be focused, right? Like sometimes you just gotta cut people out who don't fit the mode of you trying to get to where you wanna go, right? Like that's just kind of the harsh reality of it. Until you reach a point where you then can go back and bring everyone else up with you because now you're giving from a place of abundance because you took care of yourself, right? So like, You know, how do you like, like, I'm really interested to understand, like, how do you like um, connect and like bring other, because obviously you're a very successful man, like you you crush it time and time again, like you have obviously like proven that you know the steps in order to crush it. So like, how do you communicate that and like help other people of, of, that look like us and Heather, right? A woman, right? How do you help other minorities and women prove that they can, that you, you can look like you and you can make it too. And like, here's the roadmap. Like, how do you like, you know, how did you like communicate that to the market, man? Are, are you sure you want to go down this path? Bro, we already started, man. We already, the, <laughs> the ball is rolling downhill. <laughs> All right. Oh. You gave me permission, ladies and gentlemen. So here we go. I, I, I love your heart, right? But here's the thing. Everybody's not going to go. Everybody doesn't want to be extracted. There are people who are just fine, fat, dumb, happy in their ignorant bliss. And anybody who comes to tell them that there is anything else available to them is the enemy. And they will do everything they can to destroy you because you're ruining their foundation. You're ruining their basis for existence. My role is to go to this place, do this thing. And once I do that thing, they're going to send me a check. And one day they may decide that they don't want to pay me anymore. And then I've got to figure out how I'm going to take care of my family. Everybody doesn't want that. They don't want that freedom. They're scared of that, Desmond. The they don't want is the created. freedom. They don't want the responsibility. They don't want the outcome. They don't want any of it. The construct is created in order for us to believe that we're safe. 
it's all thought out for us. All we have to do is follow the plan. You got the plan when you were five. Hey, Desmond, be good in school, get good grades so you can get into a good school. And then if you get that degree, you'll, you'll get a good job and then you'll get married. You'll have 2.5 kids. You'll get the dog. You get two luxury cars. If you're upper middle class, you have the picket fence with the two story house. And then you'll work to pay for that stuff. Because Correct. if you don't pay for that stuff, you're not truly successful. And you'll do that until you potentially get to retire one day, but hopefully. And if you do that, then you will have lived a successful life. And don't forget going to church and joining the Rotary Club and taking the kid to whatever the sports is. That's the path. To, oh, I know. Uh, <laughs> Dying. Anything but a fulfilling life. Anything but a fulfilling life. Man, I think that my, I, I was literally following that path until I told you that moment where I cried in my car when I had the red pill, man, of like asking myself the tough questions. Like, am I really like, is this it? Right? Like, is this, is this, is this it? There's two questions. Is this it or is there more? Mm -hmm. Whoever asks those questions is seeking. Now, the question is, will they actually follow? Right? Neo gets told to follow the right rabbit, but they won't necessarily follow. But I, I'm off the path. Your question is, how do you present yourself to the people? I, I don't care who comes, right? The content is provided for you in the manner. It's going to be provocative. It may be a little controversial, but it's to provoke thought is to provoke you to continue to ask the questions to really understand whether or not you believe what you're doing or you're just running the program. Many oh. of the parents program their children for ease of control. And then when we become adults, we still need other people to tell us what to do instead of being able to think for ourselves. And so my favorite example in this, because the people are shaking their head and they're saying, this guy's nuts. What is he talking about? Here's the thing. If I was to sneeze right now and you were in the room with me, what would you say? Because you're a courteous person. Bless you. Sure. Why? I have no fucking idea. <laughs> yeah. So the reason was years ago, people thought that your heart stopped beating. And so the Lord blessed you by allowing you to continue to live after you sneezed. I've Nobody learned something new today. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows that, right? So, oh, well, I mean, that's the courteous thing to do. I'm considerate. No, you're not. You're just doing something somebody else told you to do. You don't actually believe that somebody needs to be blessed in order to keep breathing or living after they sneeze. But you're running the program. And I, I can go down the path, right? Your religion, whatever you practice, or if you practice nothing, is it because you chose that or because your parents did it? Because nine out of 10 people are just doing what they saw their parents do. Does that serve you? Or are you a slave to something that doesn't actually serve you? That's when things get scary. So for me, I, I have freedom from it. So when I just left corporate, I decided I wasn't going to do things for money anymore. It's like, it's all about impact for me. How can I impact the most people? And what you said was really interesting. Oh, you, you go, you go be successful. Then you come back, you bring other people on because you're living from a place of abundance, right? I'm gonna hop on a plane tomorrow. We're going to St. Lucia. The lady is going to stand up there. And she's going to say, hey, put your mask on first. It doesn't matter if the bag inflates or not. Oxygen is flowing, but make sure you do that before you try to help anyone else around you. So yes, you have to do it from a place of prosperity because I want to go back to the red pill model. And I told you about level six, but let's talk about the first five, which is truly self-actualization. Relationships, is level two self-image is level one so what you just described is i'm going to change my self-image i'm going to change who i am because you have to become the person first before you can do the things necessary to have what you want i'm going to become this new person what does that mean i'm going to make a promise i'm gonna keep it i'm gonna make another promise i'm gonna keep it and i'm going to create these habits which create the life that i want okay got that people see me making this change some are asking me what i'm doing 
The favorite question when somebody leaves corporate America is how are you going to pay for your insurance as if there's not a marketplace <laughs> to go get it, right? Then we go to the next level, which is the relationships, right? So the relationships is where this gets really, really intense. There are three types of relationships. Ones that will never be mutually beneficial. It doesn't matter what you do. Then there's the ones that could be mutually beneficial, but you don't require them to be mutually beneficial. The third one is the ones that are already mutually beneficial. The ones that will never be mutually beneficial, they got to go immediately. And then if they want to come back at another point, they can if they want to show up as mutually beneficial. The ones in the middle, you don't require them to be mutually beneficial. You have to reframe that relationship in order for it to stay in your life. If you don't reframe that relationship, it is parasitic. Therefore, it's unhealthy. You are doing that person a disservice by being source for them. So be careful with being source, right? It needs to be a reciprocal and a regenerative relationship. You can't take withdrawals without making deposits. It's not the way it works. And then the final one, mutually beneficial, you need more of that. So what I found with the people that I work with the most is that they are usually source. And so it's unhealthy. They feel drained. They feel empty. They're sowing, they're serving, but the people who come to them, bring them nothing. Mm -hmm. And they can't understand why they're so tired it's because the energy suckers are taking all of it. Right? So then we go to level three, which is work, work. When you actually can take your mask off and show up with your true morals and values, that's when you're, sphere of influence increases that's when your responsibility grows and that's when your compensation jumps right those three things self-image relationship and work create all the stress in your life this is why when people try to go be an investor and they haven't fixed this stuff they crumble they don't have the right foundation and so what are you talking about jerome well whoever's a listener out there when's the last time you said you had to take the edge off What'd you do? Was it healthy? Did you go do yoga? Did you go lift weights? Did you go for a run? No, you did not. You did something that was self-destructive. And so now why are you doing self-destructive things? Oh, cause I needed to numb the pain. Why did I need to numb the pain? Because the stress in my life isn't under control. So we need to fix one through three so that we can work on four, which is health. Why is health first or number four? Well, we could go to prosperity, but everybody knows a wealthy person who gave up all of their money to get their health back. So why go backwards? Why not fix the health before you get the prosperity? When you get the prosperity, then you can get from that place of abundance, that pace of overflow. Oh, uh, well, why would I do that? Well, because it's empty. The money doesn't matter. What you do with the money is what matters. And so that's why you go to level six, which is significance, right? You make that play, whatever it is. For me, it was a fully endowed engineering scholarship at my alma mater, among other things. It's going on podcasts because I learned so much from podcasts because I wasn't smart enough to get a coach when I was getting into the space. I didn't go through any educational programs. I did everything through the school of hard knocks and it was the most inefficient, ineffective way to learn things. It was idiotic, but I did it because I thought I was smart. But then when I thought about all of the stuff that got paid for in order for me to get the certifications and the degrees that I had, I realized two things. One, I didn't value education because I never paid for any of it. Somebody else paid for it. So I didn't get an, or really understand what the investment that was made. So now here I am trying to undo the things that I did one by teaching other people how to do it because I did it all the wrong way in the hard way so I can collapse time frames for people. But two, my coach costs a hundred grand a year because I know what it, it brings for me. So I could go on a rant, man, but here's the thing. When you're source, you have to create the content that the people actually need. Now, Tony Robbins talks about giving them candy so that they will actually take the medicine. And when you want to go to mass, when you want to have mass marketing, okay, got it. But when people actually know who you are, they know your heart, you can give them what they actually need. 
And so that's the space that I play in. It's really having a direct conversation. Jerome, I want to learn how to invest in multifamily real estate. Okay, great. There's a course for that. I'm not going to tell you how to do that. If you want to do to actually be ready for that, you want to become the person you need to be in order to attract the folks into your life so that you have a network of accredited investors to go buy big deals. I can help you do that. That's where I'll spend my time because that transformation is going to be a ripple effect that none of us can actually fathom because of who you're going to become in the process. Wow, man. Oh, that's, that was sick. Um, man, you can, you can rant on the pod anytime, man. Um, you yeah. crushed it and I love it, dude. Very thought provoking. Um, we got Mr. Jerome Meyer. So, you know, let's, let's end it with this, man. So like, how can people find you, right? If they want to, you know, get your course, if they want to request, request you to be a speaker, like how, how can people find you, man? Yeah. Jerome Myers.co is the place to go. You can pick your rabbit hole and you can learn about all the fun things where you got going on. Do you ask people for the red pill on the, on the, on the homepage first before they enter like red pill, you know, click red pill to enter or, or what? I don't, man. I don't, uh, I don't think most people are ready for it and it, it scares them when they, they see stuff like that. Cause they, and that's okay. Because if you're not ready for transformation, then we shouldn't spend time together. Exactly. I love it. So that is, that is all folks. Uh, you welcome to the end. Uh, we really appreciate having Jerome on. We will love to play with him maybe next year or later down the year with, with, with some more, with some more game. Um, if you can want to find Jerome, you can find him at Jerome Myers.co. Um, the man is definitely hot, has tons of knowledge and uh, had a bunch of fun. So don't forget to give us a rating, leave us a comment, send us some questions. If you want to come on the pod and play with us, uh, go ahead and fill out the guest form at campfirecapitalism.com slash guests. We always love to play with other entrepreneurs. And this was a doozy. Peace. Yeah,